Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Henriette Geiger. I'm the director of People in Peace in DEFCO, so in charge of human development. And uh, we, are, um, we are having a very broad spectrum in our directorate, ranging from crisis fragility, resilience building, to human rights, good governance, uh, anti-corruption, uh, to employment, uh, social protection, migration, also education, health, culture, and security, including nuclear safety. And uh, you see that uh, in our directorate, we are also dealing with the humanitarian development nexus. That's uh, why we're here and we're dealing, of course, with the key question of how to integrate social or how to use social protection schemes in a crisis context. So um, I'm very happy that you're interested in that key question. And I welcome UNICEF as our collaborative partner of the event, but also of the whole exercise and our experts, of course, and I would like to thank them for their valuable input and their contribution to the guidance package. And of course, our colleagues from international partners, ILO, UNHCR, civil society, research, and our colleagues from DG Employment, ECHO, NIR, and of course, our own house. I would like to provide you with a very brief overview of the forthcoming guidance document on shock sensitive social protection related to the nexus and of our experience in DEFCO. And we would very much uh, encourage you, we thank you for your interest this afternoon, but we would like you to become our ambassadors in your respective organizations in the field to really see how we can apply social protection across the humanitarian development nexus. This, um, this event was also supposed to be live streamed, but for technical difficulties, we're only videotaping this, and it's supposed to be made available to many delegations uh, around the world who have registered for this as a live stream event. So I have already spoken a little bit about what we think that uh, the social protection has an incredible potential in reducing poverty and inequalities. And it therefore represents a key policy area for the EU, both inside internally and when it comes to supporting partner countries in achieving the vision of the 2030 agenda. Especially our mantra of leaving no one behind. Over the last two decades, social protection has continued to expand across partner countries. But I, it's probably no secret that we have huge challenges persisting. And partner countries often face enormous difficulties in raising enough government revenue on their own to provide adequate social project protection. There's also a huge coverage ca gap the ILO World Social Protection Report, uh, 17 to 19, sadly confirms that only 45% of the world's population are effectively protected by a social protection system by at least one type of social protection benefit. In the poorest countries, this holds only true for one in five poor people. In this respect, the European Union has largely focused its support to partner countries on social assistance and social inclusion. In DEFCO, we are increasingly operating in fragile environments, so that development action has come closer to humanitarian action and as well to foreign and security policy considerations. And we see this trend likely to continue. Moving from linking relief, rehabilitation and development to humanitarian and development joint frameworks, we are now working within a broader humanitarian development peace nexus. 
you know that the peace nexus was only added in the council uh, last year and we're still trying to integrate it but we feel that whether it was or not added to the to our term in the contexts where we operate security issues are always a concern so uh, whether we want or not we have we better acknowledge that this is influencing and impacting what we do so this nexus is all about better coordination but it's also about jointly assessing the situation to understand better the fragilities and their root causes so we can have a better, more targeted support. This broader nexus approach po poses also many challenges for the action involved, as we all have different mandates and different ways of working. For a few years now, we in DEFCO, in DEFCO have a special unit working on resilience. That's the unit in our directorate which is coordinating and providing guidance on the nexus. For DEFCO, the longer term programming horizons in our development corporations are simply not flexible enough to adequately respond to fragilities and resilience. More than a question of our partners' resilience, it's also about the resilience of our development investments. In an ever-changing world, our efforts must be therefore more future-proof. And this is one of the reasons why we have increased the coordination of our policies and aid instruments across our development and humanitarian action. In the fragile context, recurring shocks and stresses affect a large share of the population and put considerable strain on or overwhelm already the nascent and inadequate delivery systems. We have all seen that and we see that time again and again. And in situations of crisis, mostly donor-funded NGO humanitarian assistance fill the gap. But experience from a growing number of fragile and conflict-affected countries is showing that social protection has considerable potential to support the recovery, resilience, and livelihoods among the people who are most affected. I'm sure you will hear this afternoon several examples of where this has already been applied. And of course, we want to build together with you that body of knowledge and make it available for cross-learning of all of us. We want that social protection is a topic that is on the top of our agenda. And social protection needs to be a very integral part of our Nexus work. So today we will provide you with an insight into the guidance package and some of the technical notes which will complement the recently published joint DEFCO ECONIR reference doc document, which is available to you. Likewise, you can witness good commission practices on how this materializes. A last remark. The guidance package is a quite atypical European Commission's in-house and cross-service initiative. In addition to the highly committed individual colleagues in each DG, it is also required to have quite substantial expert support. And we received, of course, the support uh, from the methodological knowledge sharing support program. So very thank, uh, very thank you for this. And um, at, which is a DEFCO knowledge sharing provider. And uh, we, want to um, we want to make you all part of this extended team of professional expertise to widen the what we have already done what we have done is a good basis but it's only as good as you make it so the ball is in your hand we want you to run with it develop it further and make it come alive so 
all the theoretical work that we put together is to no avail if we cannot apply it. And we have to make the case that it works. We have to collect concrete results from the ground and feed that into the debate and let our colleagues know that it works. And like that, we can come to a more comprehensive use of that and a more integrated use. And also, we need to convince our partner countries. Without them, we can preach and, and, and do whatever we want if they don't see the practical value and if we don't help them to come up with systems to finance this in the long term with DRM, domestic resource mobilization, we will not be able to have a sustainable, uh, a sustainable usage. So these are all bigger questions that I hope we can explore this afternoon. But as I said, it's only the beginning of the process and we invite you all to help us to enhance and improve uh, our knowledge base. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And I would like to uh, start by thanking uh, DEFCO for inviting us to this, uh, to this launch. Um, and to really congratulate DEFCO, ECO, and NIR for coming together to issue such a comprehensive document. We know it's not, uh, it's not always easy, but really it makes our life easier because you have uh, one, guidance, uh, one set of guidance. Um, interestingly, just two months ago, I think we had a high-level discussion on the humanitarian development nexus. And so it's, um, I think it's very interesting that now today we are focusing on this uh, particular aspect of, uh, of social protection. It gets, uh, it's becoming more and more concrete, I think, for, for, for us. Um, UNICEF has a very comprehensive partnership with, uh, with DEFCO, uh, as well as ECO and NIR, and it covers a lot of areas, traditionally um, education, child protection, nutrition, and health. In the recent years, we've seen a lot of... Um, uh, we've seen our partnership also improving in the areas of gender because of the Spotlight Initiative and social protection, which is the topic of uh, today. And particularly since the 2000, 2017 uh, International Conference on Social Protection in Context of Fragility and Forced Displacement, we have seen this, uh, this dialogue and, and partnership um, being strengthened. We were very happy to see that many of the key principles um, that we discussed at the international conference uh, two years and a half ago are actually part of this uh, guidance notes, and um, such as um, uh, people-centered uh, social protection system, human rights uh, uh, approach, uh, um, inclusiveness, leave no one behind, um, humanitarian principles, and this uh, this important uh, concept of the of the nexus between humanitarian uh, and uh, development, and uh, indeed in practice, because we're also a very pragmatic organization, we've seen that um, our, our dialogue has been translated into some very concrete initiatives uh, on, the, on the ground, and I'm glad we will have uh, the opportunity to, to listen to some of our colleagues. I, I just want to, to, to mention uh, uh, three of them. Um, in Cambodia and in Pakistan, we have, uh, UNICEF has been providing technical assistance to the government to uh, accompany the budget support provided by the EU. And I think it's a very good example of collaboration where we, we complement uh, each other. Um, UNICEF and, uh, and the ILO are also working together with uh, support from the, from the EU to provide expertise to our colleagues on the ground and to, uh, uh, in selected uh, countries and to start some uh, um, social protection uh, programs. And finally, I wanted to mention the program we have in, uh, in Turkey on the conditional cash transfer for education which uh, this cash program is interesting because it goes through the Turkish uh, social protection system. So we did not set up a parallel system. We are strengthening actually the national system. And at the same time, it's focusing on refugee children on a scale that is uh, quite unprecedented, I think, for, for all of us, uh, benefiting uh, hundreds of thousands of children. So we um, really look forward uh, uh, to continuing our discussion, our dialogue with uh, De DEFCO, uh, ECO and NIR, and also to see how we can operationalize these important principles and notes. Uh, thank you very much. And finally, before we get to the meat of, uh, of the discussions uh, today, um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. I know a lot of the people in the room, many UNICEF colleagues, but uh, quite a few folks I don't know. I'm Alexandra Yester from, from UNICEF uh, New York. Um, and I, I just want to, to say a few things about what social protection and this nexus means to, to UNICEF and how we look <coughs> forward to continuing our collaboration with the EU and the many other partners we've been working with on, um, in this area, UNHCR, ILO, World Food Program, and many, um, and many uh, bilaterals as well. For UNICEF, social protection has become a really major area of operation. It wasn't 15 years ago. Today it is. UNICEF is active in social protection in well over 100 countries. UNICEF has also always been known for its humanitarian role since, since its birth um, in, in 1947, but really since then and actually more recently, it has actually been our largest area um, of growth. And sadly, and as we all know, this is not an area which is going to go away for any of us, um, for, for all partners um, working, um, working on, on human rights and, and development. So with, with those, those facts in, in mind, for us it's quite obvious the need to, to make sure that social protection is fit for purpose and fit for the purpose of the world today, which means you don't know when you're going to have hundreds of thousands of people pouring over your border. You don't know when climate emergency is going to come home to your country and things are going to change and you're going to rapidly need to support many additional, uh, many additional people. Um, we know that the crises that are there have been there for a long time as well. That protracted crisis will continue to be a, a reality. It, it, it simply doesn't make sense. It's like a luxury we can't afford to, to work with, um, to work in, a, in silos and to say, oh, well, we're just going to do this in development and now we're going to respond to the emergency. But you all know this. I'm, I'm preaching to the, to the converted here. Um, we, we also, um, we've been honored to have the opportunity to think through really how we do this together with many partners and especially with the EU. And it was that thinking through that led to the decision to hold, um, to hold the international conference here with the, with the EU together with many other partners in, um, in 2017. We see this guidance that uh, first came out, I think it's in February, is that right? Um, as a really clear example of the EU's commitment and carrying on the results of that conference. And by the way, the reason I got up during, uh, while Sandy was speaking was because I had forgotten to bring this up and I wanted to remind everyone who doesn't have a copy of this, I'm not sure if there are any more left out there, but I put a few copies out. This is the outcome document from that meeting short and sweet and saying, here's what we need to do. Here's what we know and here's what we need to do to make sure that social protection is fit for responding. Social protection systems can respond in situations of fragility and, um, and forced displacement. The SPAN guidance is a, a wonderful example of taking that three, four, five steps Forward. So what does that actually mean in practice? What can countries do? What can partners do to make, um, to make a real difference? Um, and we absolutely believe that this guidance will serve not only the EU and EU delegations, but all partners working in social protection. And one of the things that, that really, um, one of the nice things about working in social protection is we really do work together very well as partners. Um, and we have, and I was glad to see that the, the guidance is located on a common platform that we all use, socialprotection.org. Anybody can get a hold of it and, and get, that, um, get that information um, uh, to, to use for their work, um, including, including counterparts, getting quick access um, to it. For UNICEF, what I can say is having having been very much a part of the consultative process in which the, the document was, was developed, um, and my colleagues involved in that are, 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 sitting, uh, are sitting here, we are very confident in the quality and the value and the basis of everything that is written in that guidance document. And so you can be assured that that document will form the basis for UNICEF country offices understanding and continued work and collaboration 
with the EU and with other partners on the area of social protection in these, um, in these crisis contexts, something that we will be doing more and more because UNICEF is absolutely committed to it. UNICEF globally, our strategic plan has committed us to helping countries to improve social protection to be able to respond um, to crisis situations. So every UNICEF colleague in this room is working on that in one way, um, in one way or another and looks forward to working with, with all of you, those in the room and those per who might uh, perhaps hear this um, on, on a recording um, later on. Um, we are, uh, we quite specifically in, in the collaboration that we have going on um, now in the, the new uh, social protection action um, program of, um, of the EU, which is g providing support to, to UNICEF and the ILO to work together in eight countries. Um, it will also be a, a part of, um, of, that, uh, of that work. Um, we recognize, of course, and I, I think it's important to emphasize that it, it's not all clear sailing ahead. Um, there are a lot of challenges that we all continue to face in bridging, um, in bridging this gap. Um, and part of it comes from the fact that within our very own institutions, UNICEF at least as much as the EU and all the rest of the world, we talk about bridging the nexus, but we have two separate architectures. So I think that's something that we all need to work on. How can we bring this together? How can we make, understand social protection as, as part and parcel and a con contribution to humanitarian response and not something separate um, and, and apart or only to be, uh, to be dealt with um, later. But meanwhile, we have, we have this guidance, we have this excellent set of technical notes which can take us all further on telling that story, on helping partners to address social protection in ways that will make it a tangible tool to address fragility, forced displacement, protracted conflict, and the many challenges ahead of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentations uh, that